I about ran the tiller to death, and it's a new tiller. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Front or back time? Hmm? Front time or back time? Uh, back time. Oh, yeah. I dug trenches across the yard to plant all the plants in. <laughs> about yay deep and real long. And after I got finished with those, I went out behind the garage and dug a trench for putting all the yellow berries in. Again, so it stays loose, makes my work a little easier. <laughs> I was still worn out last night. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've had a few of those days. Not many since that pool got completed. <laughs> See, you got to learn to delegate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, She's the one that's always tired in their house. Very <laughs> <laughs> I've only got one person I can delegate to, and she can almost outwork me now. Yeah, I yeah, gotta watch yeah, her and become yeah. something useless. Yeah, you'll be in trouble for sure. Well, yeah. that's where I am at. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. Tell you what, Jerry, I'll be a sympathy partner, but I can't join you yet. <laughs> <laughs> you a will. sympathy partner? Well, I will eventually, yeah. But I'm in no hurry. I'm still climbing the trees and tying the ropes off the branch. Well, I gotta do that part yet. Still getting out of the chainsaw and chopping down trees. Yeah, yeah, he still wants to I I guess I gave that up. Last time I was up there, I went up about four times. Then I took the chainsaw up. No, this ain't gonna go. This is not gonna work. There's something about being on the limb with the chainsaw just didn't fit. Well, for me, my problem I, is I gotta watch out for the wires because they're all over the edge of the road. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, good evening, everyone. Good to have you with us tonight, and good to have those joining us online. I saw Sandy and a couple others are have logged on already, and good to have them with us. Um, and good to have you that are here tonight with us. Midway through the week, you know what this service is, don't you? It's a service you know you get halfway through the week and you go ah, you know now I think I can make it uh, from here on out so praise the Lord for the opportunity to have a halfway through the week uh, service and uh, sometimes like uh, Frank was saying beforehand he's been working real hard that um, halfway through the week means you can only, you can only work yourself half more uh, until the week is done so We'll, uh, we'll accept that and hope that helps. Um, it's good to uh, have you. I hope that you had a good week, a good day, and a good week so far this week. Sunshine was nice, wasn't it? We had warm temperature. Uh, this morning I walked out, and I went right back in the house, got me a jacket, and came out. Came to church. I was here till noon. I walked out with that jacket on. Sweat started beating up my forehead, and I thought, now that is what I like. Mm. Okay. Um, but boy, it warmed up really nice. I guess it's that time of the year when we have cold mornings with moisture on everything and then uh, warm afternoons. It'd be nice if that lasted through maybe April. And then, uh, you know, <laughs> then it starts getting warm at night too. So uh, wishful thinking, I think, on my part. But we are glad to have you with us. A great Sunday. A uh, great first of eight classes in our new Sunday School class, taking the first steps, and uh, someone said that we had 39 here, and uh, we had several online, so uh, we exceeded our expectations, and uh, we thank the Lord for that, and uh, uh, hopefully people have uh, I learned, uh, so a few people that have uh, contacted me and said, now, how far are we supposed to go in this book? And I thought, overachievers, you know how that is. They want to go all the way to the back of the book. But I said, you can't go any further than the first lesson, second lesson. And if you do, I'll have to take the ruler out and take care of you. They sounded real concerned on the phone. You know? so, um, but uh, I'm excited about uh, the comments that we've received, um, email from people that watch us, as well as from people that were here. And pray that the enthusiasm continues and that we learn some things. Uh, if you're joining us in, online and you, you weren't here for last Sunday's class on taking the first steps, 
uh, how do I uh, start my walk with Jesus? Um, eight weeks. Last week was the first week. You can go right back online. You can look on YouTube, uh, our website, or Facebook, and you can find that first lesson. One of the most important things we did last Sunday was learn how to start memorizing Scripture. And I'm, I'm really excited about seeing how, uh, here are the stories of people, how they tried to do that, success or failure, either one, uh, for this next Sunday. But you only missed one week. We hope that you'll join us uh, 9.15 this coming Sunday. But for tonight, we have uh, prayer time and we have Bible study. And uh, before we get started, let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, we are thankful tonight for uh, the mobility that we have. Uh, Lord, we take for granted a lot of times uh, the fact that we can make a decision of whether or not we want to come to church or whether or not we want to go to the store, whether or not we want to take a drive. And yet there are a lot of people that are not able to do what we may consider a simple and yet um, <clears throat> regular thing. So we thank you, Lord, for our mobility. We thank you for the cognitive uh, ability we have to be able to process thought. Uh, many people suffer from the dreadful beginnings of um, dementia, and uh, some uh, go way deep into that. Uh, Lord, so sad, and we thank you for giving us the ability to just think and process thoughts. Uh, thank you for your word uh, given to us in uh, pages in our language, in a nice covered book. And uh, Lord, for the knowledge to be able to learn it and find your truths in it. And I pray, Father, that you continue to bless us as we uh, submit ourselves to your word and to the spirit of Christ and ask him to direct our thoughts and our study. That, uh, Lord, you might be praised with our diligence and our desire. And that, uh, Lord, your spirit would lead us into truth. And we pray, Father, tonight as we study this subject that we have before us, that you give full understanding. And we'll give you praise. Lord, you're worthy of all that we give, more than we could ever give. And we praise you tonight for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been uh, studying a study within a study. The primary study is a question that was asked, what's the difference between the local church and the universal church? And uh, I don't know that I really ever did say this. When we say universal church, we're speaking of everyone who's ever confessed Christ as their Savior. When we speak of local church, we think of the building and the people that are in this building. So the universal is anyone that has ever called upon the name of Christ Jesus, their Savior. And the local church is where you'd go to join that group. <laughs> That's your, a local assembly somewhere. So those are the big, big the two questions. That's what the question is. Is, that, is there a difference between them? <clears throat> and you know why someone would ask the question? Because they've been told that there is. And so they want to know, is there a difference? And if so, what is it? And so that's where we're heading. And uh, the controversy has been around for a long time. There are many that would say, there is no such thing as a universal church. Because they deny that people that do not believe in the fundamentals of the faith are saved. So they cannot be in a church. So the only local church is one that is referred to as a New Testament church by their definition. And that's the only church that there is. So this is the controversy. And we said, well, where did that all begin? Well, it's, it's been around for a long, long time, but it took a national uh, um, recognition under Mr. Graves. It became national, this plot. Mr. Graves believes that 
the only church is a local church. There's no such thing as a universal church. Mr. Grave believed that since we would not have certain people come into our pulpits and preach because they may not believe in the tenets of the faith that we believe, that then they could not be Christians. And so that's the, that's the issue. That's the question. And so that was our question. What's the difference between a universal church and a local church? Is there a difference? And if so, what is it? And I said, well, let's get some history. That was Mr. Graves. But the before we went too much further, I said, there's some things that we need to know that are undeniable. And this will help us answer that question very easily. And those undeniable truths are there are divisions in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. It goes further than that, but divisions in the Bible. You just can't deny that. Uh, the difference, there is a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. You can't deny that. We looked at a bunch of scriptures when we went through that. If you're just joining us or you didn't get that lesson, go back and uh, uh, find that lesson. It's about five weeks ago, maybe four or five weeks ago. And uh, the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. There is a difference. A person that does not make the distinction of that difference does it to their own peril when they come to study in the Bible. They're going to get it all messed up. All right. Uh, number three, Peter and Paul had different ministries. And we've seen that in many different places, but nothing could make it clearer than Galatians 2.7. And we looked at that, and we spent some time looking at that. They had different ministries. We also said that Paul's ministry was unlike the ministry of John the Baptist, and it was unlike the ministry of Jesus. We're going to learn some more about that tonight. But it's an undeniable truth. It was different. They, they were not the same. There's no question about that. And we said that the main difference between the ministry of Paul and John the Baptist and Jesus was the audience. Paul's audience is different than John the Baptist or Jesus's. And we looked at Matthew chapter uh, 10 and verse 5. We, we looked at a lot of different places. Uh, we're not going to retrace that, but those are, you, you cannot deny these truths. You might not believe them. There are a lot of people that don't believe the truth. It doesn't change the truth. Okay, the truth is the truth. You can't deny this. Number six, the Bible must be viewed from the position of ethnicity. There's only three ethnic groups found in the Bible. Jew, Gentile, Church of God. You have to, you have to say, anytime you read a letter, to whom is it written? We know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And then it gives us the different areas that it is profitable in. But just because it's given by inspiration and it's profitable doesn't mean that it was written specifically to everyone. And so we have to look in the Bible. We have to find out to whom is it being written. Nothing is clearer on this matter than James 1.1 1, 1 and Acts chapter 2. You just can't, you can't miss that. Or Matthew chapter 10 verse 5. You cannot miss that, looking at those places. So the Bible must be viewed uh, through the lens of ethnicity. To, to whom is it being addressed? And then seven, differences must be noted. When you see the, the difference, you just have to say, okay, it might be against everything my grandma ever told me. <laughs> okay? Unless your grandma, she's probably a sweet lady, but on this score, she was wrong. It doesn't matter. You have to note those differences. And then number eight, the word church means assembly. And we spend a lot of time with that. Every time we look at the Bible, and we're going through three different words, church, gospel, and baptism. We haven't got to that yet, but we're going to do it tonight and the next week. But every time we see the word church, every time we see the word gospel, every time we see baptism, our minds begin to formulate what we think that word means to us. But when we do that, we're looking through the lens of Paul's ministry to get that definition. And rightfully so for us, 
But that doesn't mean that every time those words appear in the Bible, it is through the lens of Paul's ministry. And that's the error. The error is assuming that because the word church is church, that it means the same every place in the Bible. But we spent a lot of time looking at this. Acts chapter 7 was one of those places, I think it was uh, verse 5, where the Old Testament Israelite going through the wilderness was considered a church. The reason is because the word church means assembly. You can have an assembly of anything. Assembly of Cub Scouts, an assembly of baseball players, an assembly of disgruntled church members. <laughs> I mean, you can have a you can have an assembly of anything. All right, that word church means assembly, and just because the word church is used in the Bible, it doesn't mean a New Testament Bible believing church like we know. And then the word gospel. The word gospel means good news. That's where we left off last week, and we're going to pick it up uh, tonight right there. The gospel means good news. It does not always mean salvation by grace through faith, plus or minus nothing. That's the lens of Paul's ministry. When we get gospel, we think of faith, grace, plus or minus nothing. For by grace you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is the gift of God. Paul called it his gospel. So there's a difference when we look at the Bible, just because the word gospel is, is used. It's not to be seen through the lens of Paul's ministry. As we'll see tonight, gospel simply means good news. All right. So let's spend some time doing that tonight. And when we look at the, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, there are two different gospels. There's the gospel to the kingdom of heaven, and there's the gospel to the kingdom of God. We're going to see that tonight, but there are other gospels other than that. Again, don't forget, don't think Paul's ministry gospel. The word gospel means good news. There's a lot of good news in the Bible. And it's not all that Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scripture. All right, so we're going to look at that tonight. So first of all, the gospel of the kingdom, which is a Jewish earthly kingdom, this one right up here, kingdom of heaven, a Jewish earthly kingdom. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, we'll just spend some time, old-fashioned Bible drill here. Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, and look at verse 23. Matthew chapter 24, and verse number 23. Matthew 24, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Notice what it says. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their what? Synagogues, not church. All right? Not their church buildings. In the synagogues, all right? And preaching what? The gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and all those that were sinners came and said, How can I be free from the sins and the condemnation of my sins? Now, if you're there in the passage, you know that's not what it says at all. Nobody looked at the gospel of the kingdom as... Jesus died for my sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures because he hadn't done that yet, right? So what's the gospel of the kingdom? It has something to do with healing. Look at verse 24. That's the reason they brought sick people to him. Uh, those that were possessed with devils, lunatics, those that had the palsy, he healed them. And what happened? There was followed him a great multitude. Gospel of the Kingdom. Uh, gospel of the Kingdom. Look at chapter 24 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24. And look at verse number 14. 24 and verse 14. We'll start at verse 11. Matthew 24, verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. 
And because iniquity shall abound, sin will abound. The love of many shall wax cold. Because the sin abound, uh, people stop loving one another, okay? But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, very words in the Bible are very important, okay? You go to a free will Baptist, or you go to uh, some Nazarenes, or you go to uh, Church of God, uh, Anderson, Indiana variety, uh, and they will say that the end in our passage is the end of your life. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. So they'll say, if you don't live it, your salvation, you lose it. And they'll quote Matthew 24, 13 as a proof text for that. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And then it comes up there to verse number uh, 14, and they'll say this gospel is to be preached until the end of your life. And that's hold out. I hope you make it. Live it. I hope you don't make a sin and have an accident before you get time to forgive. Ask for forgiveness. Because he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, the problem with that, the first problem is, is verse 3. And it's a wonderful thing about the Bible is it always explains itself. The problem is that nobody wants the Bible to explain itself. Everybody wants to explain what the Bible means. I'm not interested in explaining what the Bible means. I want to know what the Bible says. And look at verse number 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What was he talking about? Verse number 1, Jesus went out, departed from the temple, not the church, the temple, and the disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple, not the church, the temple. And Jesus said to them, See ye not all these things? What's he pointing to? This, the temple. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another. He's talking about the temple. Yeah. That shall not be thrown down. Mm -hmm. Then they said, <clears throat> Tell us, verse 3, halfway down, When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the, uh-oh, end of the what? Not your life. The world. The world. Verse 13, he that endureth to the end, your life? No, the world shall be saved. Saved like ask Jesus to come in your heart and be saved? No. Delivered. He that endureth to the end shall be delivered. If you make it through the tribulation, what's going to happen? You're going to be delivered. And what's that message? The gospel of the kingdom. Verse 14, it will be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. And then he goes right back into the tribulation. Look at verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of de desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand on the holy place. Remember we talked in 2 Thessalonians about the uh, mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed. Then the Lord shall consume with his... That's, that's this. This is in the middle of the tribulation. The Antichrist gets a deadly wound. He goes from being the man of sin, the son of perdition. He's resurrected. He stands in the holy place. That's the abomination of desolation. And he declares himself to be God. Middle of the tribulation. So Jesus is saying, the end is going to come. And uh, this gospel is going to be preached until the end. This gospel is not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's no way it could be. He hasn't even died yet. 
This is the gospel of the kingdom that's given to us in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, excuse me, chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5. And um, it's called the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, and shall, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the what? The earth. They're going to inherit the earth. It's an earthly kingdom. <clears throat> Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, so they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, so they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of who? Heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revive you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil falsely against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Not up there in heaven, look at the context. What's the heaven? Earth, 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 earth. They're going to be rewarded in the kingdom of heaven. Um, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted the prophets that were before you. You're the salt of the earth, but salt lost the favor, wherewith shall it be salted. It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men uh, high, uh, light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, so they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come to, not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law, till it all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he should be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. It's all earthly kingdom of heaven. The Beatitudes are not the way the Christian is supposed to live their life. That is a make-believe from someone that does not distinguish the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, they try to make them the same. And so here they are getting this round peg of Matthew chapter 5, the attitudes, and slamming it as hard as they can through a round, a, a square peg in a round hole. Splinters are going every which direction. They say, see? See? But it's not, this is not about the kingdom of God. It's about the earthly kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. That is the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is giving them the gospel of the kingdom. And it's all the way down through there. All right. I say to you, verse 20, except your righteousness shall succeed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Is that the standard for us? What's the standard for us? The righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? What's the standard for us? Christ. Christ's righteousness. And can we attain that righteousness? No. What's he have to do? He has to impute it or give it to us. Mm -hmm. This is not the same gospel. This is the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 5. You've heard verse 21. It was said unto them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not kill. Uh, uh, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, Raka, uh, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou foe, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now, honestly, do you think any of you that called me a fool would be in danger of losing your salvation? I have called many people in front of me going down the road. <laughs> They've been foolish. Okay. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to the brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Trying to make this New Testament Christian doctrine 
is about the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. But it, almost every book you pick up on Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, is going to try to make it Christian doctrine. You couldn't, you have to fabricate it to get it to, and twist it and manipulate it and say what this means is all the time when it doesn't mean that. So I'm just saying, we're talking about this gospel of the kingdom and this gospel of the kingdom is being preached to a Jewish audience and this gospel of the kingdom is about repent for the kingdom is heaven is hand and there are some rules and standards that need to be applied to your life if you're going to inherit this kingdom and one of those is is that you're going to have to endure through the toughest of tribulation and if you make it to the end you're going to be delivered if you don't make it to the end you're not going to be delivered that's all there is to it all right so this is the matthew 24. look at uh, luke chapter uh, 4 and verse 18 matthew mark luke luke chapter 4 and look at verse 8 Matthew 4, verse 18. Uh, get uh, Isaiah 61 in your other hand. What did we say the definition of the good news is? Or excuse me, of the, the gospel. What does the gospel mean? It means good news, right? The gospel means good news. So look at Isaiah 61. Just for your information, in case you don't know this. Jesus in Luke 4 asked for a scroll as he sits in the temple, synagogue. And he asked specifically for the scroll of Isaiah 61. And he opens the book in Luke chapter 4 and he reads Isaiah 64, or excuse me, 61. So we're going to look at Isaiah 61 first. We're going to notice two things. One, where Jesus stopped reading in Luke. And two, what words he changed. All right, Isaiah 61. Notice what it says, Isaiah 61, verse 2, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath appointed me to preach good what? Tidings. What's that? That's good news. The gospel is good news. I understand that the gospel, the grace of God, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all. That is good news. <laughs> okay. But just because it's good news doesn't mean it's the same good news to everyone else. All right. Good news is what the gospel means. All right. It's describing the good news. So here the prophet Isaiah wrote and he said, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now, look back, hold your hand there in Isaiah. Look back at chapter 4 of Luke and begin in verse 18. Jesus quotes this. I mean, he reads it right out of there. Uh, look at verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered into him the book of the prophet Isaiah, as he asked for it. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the what? Gospel. The good tidings. Now, Isaiah called it good tidings. Mm -hmm. Here in Luke, it's called the gospel. You know why? Because that's what the gospel means. Good tidings. Good, good news. All right. So that's the thing I wanted you to see first. 
And then notice this, the Spirit of the Lord, Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance unto the captive, covering the sight of the blind, to set liberty, as to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, period. Look at verse 9 at 20, and he closed the book. Now go back to Isaiah 61 and look at verse 2. He closed the book right in the middle of the verse. Why? Because in verse 2 of Luke 61, you have the first coming and the second coming. The first coming is the acceptable year of the Lord, and the second coming is the day of vengeance of our God. Both comings in verse 2 of Isaiah 61, and that's the reason that Jesus, when he's sitting in the Sabbath, on the Sabbath in the synagogue, asks for a book, and he stops, <laughs> puts a period right at the end to preach the acceptable year of the Lord because it was his first coming. Do you know why there's vengeance according to Isaiah? Do you know why there's vengeance? Because he came into his own and his own received him not. And he's coming back and he's going to execute vengeance. All in one verse in Isaiah 61 verse 2. And Jesus knew that when he asked for the book, he stopped mid-paragraph, put a period there, closed the book, and then look at verse 20 of Luke chapter 4. The eyes of everyone were fastened on him. Verse 21, and he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. I'm here. I'm the acceptable year of the Lord. I'm here. This day is this scripture fulfilled. And what was it? It was the gospel. He preached the gospel. Verse 18. He preached the gospel. The good news that our Messiah has come. That's the reason that in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, don't go to the way of the Gentiles or the Samaritans. Because... The gospel, the good news I'm bringing to you, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, is that Messiah has come. And he did not come. The command in Deuteronomy was not, the Lord will raise up a deliverer for the world. He said, the Lord will raise up a deliverer among your brethren. It was not the world that needed to be delivered from Egypt. It was the nation of Israel. The acceptable year of the Lord is the Lord coming to deliver Israel. They rejected him. And so there will be a day of vengeance. <laughs> That's the second coming. And so in Matthew chapter 4, he says, This gospel of the kingdom is going to preach, be preached over the whole world until the end come. Well, why would it be all the whole world? Because the Jews have been what? Dispersed. Yeah, dispersed mm -hmm. It's people. still the same message to the same ethnic group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not like he's going to try to convert the world. It's the it's the Acts chapter one, and you shall be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That is not a commission to preach Jesus died for your sins according to the scriptures, buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, at all. They had just asked, will you at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? <laughs> he said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you should be my witnesses. It's still the gospel of the kingdom. I tell you, not that you doubt me, but I the Jews had an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ mm -hmm. when he walked this earth. Right. They had another opportunity to receive him in Acts chapter 2. Mm -hmm. They had another chance to receive him in Acts chapter 7. And they rejected every time. As vehemently as they had before. You remember Stephen? They started chewing on him. Stopped their fingers in their ear. I don't want to hear that nonsense. And after Acts chapter 7, what's the next event that happens? 
Paul, he's on his way to commit Christians to blasphemy, and he's knocked by a bright light out of the sky, and a voice that says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And we have the beginning of the gospel to the Gentiles. We have at, at John 1, 11 and 12 happen right there. He came to his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even unto you in his name. So we have this, this uh, church, or excuse me, the gospel. The idea that the gospel is always that Jesus died for our sins, according to scripture, buried, raised, rose again, third day, according to scripture. That's a fairy tale. When you read through the Bible, the gospel shows up in many different cases. And, and very few times, except for after Acts, the middle of Acts, does it ever refer to what we think of as the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The word gospel means good news. When Jesus came on the scene, it was good news. They just rejected it. All right, so let's look at a bit of this just so you can see uh, what I'm talking about. Well, before I do that, let me just show you this, because we were looking at Matthew chapter 24. Go back there if you would with me. And this is what's so funny. Uh, again, if you miss, if you miss this one, the difference in the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, you mess the whole Bible up. So in Matthew chapter 24, we already outlined what the context was. Jesus had just walked out of the synagogue with the disciples of the temple, and he said uh, about that, the disciples said, man, isn't that a beautiful building? Man, that thing is rocks, man. Look how nice that building is. And Jesus said, there's not going to be one stone left upon another. And that shook them to their knees. Because they knew the Old Testament, and they knew what the prophets said. They just know how to put it all together succinctly. And so Jesus says this about the stones not being one on top of the other. And so they immediately are arrested in their thinking. And they said to him privately, verse 3, on the Mount of Olives, where did Jesus leave in Acts chapter 1? This same Jesus, verse 12, 11 and 12. This same Jesus taken up from you shall show him again in like manner as he seemed to go up, Mount of Olives. All right, here they are, Mount of Olives. They ask him privately, tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? So Jesus begins to tell them. Matthew chapter 24, it's already obvious that they've rejected him. You know what happens after Matthew chapter 24, don't you? We have the Lord's Supper, we have the betrayal, we have the crucifixion. All right, that's what follows. And Jesus says, uh, Take heed, no man deceive you. Verse 4. Many shall come in my name, saying, I'm Christ. There will be wars and rumors of war. Verse 6. That verse 7. Nations will rise up against nations. There will be earthquake. These are just the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver up to you the afflicted and kill you. It comes all the way down. Talks about all that. Verse 13. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world. So if you look, uh, we don't really have room up here to do this, but I'm going to kind of do this right here. Old Testament. Remember how we had a big picture of this, the timeline? Old mm -hmm. Testament, New Testament, uh, trib, tribulation. Millennium. All right. So here, the gospel. Look. Here, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is being preached. And somewhere right around Acts chapter 7, it ceases to be preached. And right here, it's going to start again. Kingdom of heaven be preached here, stop, and it's going to start again. And that's what he's saying here. As we look here, they're asking him not about what's happening now, but when shall the end be? And he says, This gospel of the kingdom 
shall be preached till the end of the world. So again, we've seen this before. We've talked about it before. What's in between here? A parenthesis. He came into his own. His own received him not, but as many as received him. What did Paul write? Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be coming in. So you have the gospel of the kingdom of heaven here. It stops. And the gospel of the kingdom of heaven starts again. And it we preached. The focus of the tribulation is to bring the Jew to their knees to accept their Messiah. And it will work. And that gospel of the kingdom will be, if you can endure to the end, you'll be delivered. You'll be saved. All right? The book of Revelation is filled with the witnesses. Isn't that what Acts 1 8 says? And you shall be my witnesses. In Revelation chapter 7, what do we have? 144,000 of them. And they're going to witness the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And in short, it's a works gospel. It's Matthew chapter 5. If you're me, this is what happens. If you this, this is what happens. If you this, this is what happens. If you this, this is what happens. Is that the Christian? No. Christ became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I'm not working my way to heaven. I'm not enduring to the end. For by grace you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift. So let me ask you a question, Frank. If you say you have a gift for me, that you want to give to me, and you'll give it to me as soon as I come over and help you in the backyard, is it a gift or is it payment for services rendered? It's payment. It's payment for services. You don't get the gift after the fact, right? Right. You get the gift. If it's a true gift, you get it unconditionally at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, for by grace you save the faith that not of yourself, it is a gift. You get that at the beginning, not at the end. Are you all with me? All right, so what is in Matthew chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 7, we didn't look at this one, Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 20, all of those are about the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Every one of those. And they all are a works-oriented gospel. It's good news is not that you got saved, born again. The good news is that the Messiah has come. Yay! That's the good news. He's here. Man, it was Moses who told us that he was coming. Look how long ago that was. It's good news. The Messiah is here. We're just nailing to a tree. <laughs> you know that? And uh, they took that good news and they didn't like it. And so the good news of the kingdom of heaven is that Christ came, but they rejected that. All right? Look at Mark chapter 1. We're about out of time. Mark chapter 1. And look at verse number 1. Remember what gospel is. It's good news, right? Mark chapter 1. Mark is writing. He says, the beginning of the gospel of who? Jesus Christ. The Son of God. Now notice verse 2, the context. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And then it comes right down through, just as is forecast in the Old Testament, that before the Messiah, the Deliverer, uh, the prophet like in the Moses would come, there would be a forerunner. The good news, he's coming. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we think of the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
We think of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but Mark chapter 1, he hasn't died. He hasn't been buried, and he hasn't risen again. And after he rose from the dead, uh, the forerunner didn't come out and say, hooray, he did it. The forerunner came when Jesus walked on the scene. And John's really clear in putting this together that Zechariah was in the temple when the message from Gabriel came to him. He, you're going to have a son. You and your wife have been praying for this for a long time. Thought you were past the age you haven't. You're going to have a son. Guess what? The spirit of Elijah is going to be on him. What happened just a few months later? The same angel visited Mary. Hail, thou art highly favored among women. Blessed are the fruit of thy womb. And what happened? He said, you're going to have a son. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be better than Zachariah's wife. You're going to have it without a man. You're going to have a, 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 a son. And you're going to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy, prophecy about a virgin to be with a child. How can this thing be? You say, I know not a man. The Holy Ghost will come upon you, overshadow you. And that, that holy thing will be born of you. I mean, that, here he comes. In this order, John the Baptist first, then Jesus. Ta-da! You're king. And they rejected him. That's what Mark's writing about. He's writing about what I just told you. He is not writing about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He, he, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. The Messiah has come. And it's unmistakable when you look through the, the Bible. Now, I want you to look at another one, Revelation 14. Revelation 14. <clears throat> Revelation 14 and verse number 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as of the voice of many waters, and of the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Don't say that real fast. Uh, and they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand now if you want to know who those are you go back to Revelation chapter 7 alright Revelation chapter 7 verse 4 Revelation 7 verse 4 I heard the number of them that were sealed and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. That's what you need to highlight. <laughs> Don't let Herbert Armstrong tell you that these were spiritual Gentiles. Okay? <laughs> the Bible is the clearest book if we just let it speak and not tell it what it means. Revelation 7, 4, the 140,000 um, are 12,000 from each tribe. All right, 144,000. And when we come back here to Revelation 14, these 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth, the end of verse 3, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb with us over he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits uh, to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation 
and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, here's the gospel. This is the gospel. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and fountains of water. That's the message. Now let me ask you tonight. If I said, okay, you want to get saved? Here's how you get saved. Fear God. Give him the glory. His judgment's coming. And uh, worship him in heaven and earth and sea and fountains of water. And uh, you can be promised eternal life. You going to buy that? <laughs> no. What's missing? The death the burial, and the resurrection. That's the everlasting gospel. There are many gospels. It's the good news. What's the good news? The 144,000, if you go back to Revelation chapter 7, all right, these guys, all right, are going to preach, um, and they're going to preach for uh, during the tribulation just before the end. They're going to preach to the nation of Israel the Beatitudes. That's what they're going to preach. And that's the reason God seals them and brings them out. And notice what it says, verse 9. And after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all people, kindreds, people, and tongues, stood before the throne the before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sit upon the throne of the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders of the four beasts, and fell down to the throne of the faces to worship God, saying, Amen, blessed, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. One of the elders answered, saying, Unto me, what are those that are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. The Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, shall lead them into the living uh, fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. All right? Now, these 144,000 are going to be witnesses. They are the Acts 1-8. And they're going to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. And they're going to preach to the end. All right. So there's no question about it. These are the ones that come out of great tribulation. All right. So this gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is... Some, uh, the everlasting gospel is the, the gospel that we have been talking about. It's the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. It's called the everlasting gospel. It's preached to the Jew and the tribulation by the 144,000 Jewish virgins, men virgins. All right. Okay. We have to stop there. Next week, <clears throat> I want to look at the, the opposite side. We've seen the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, which is also referred to as the everlasting gospel. Now, next week, I want to look at the gospel of God. And we're not going to find it in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke. And we're not going to find it in Revelation. Where in the world do you think in the Bible you're going to find the gospel of the kingdom of God? Paul's letters. Mm -hmm. It is so crystal clear, the division. What did we say? There are divisions in the Bible. If you, don't, if, you, 
It doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not. It's undeniable. And if you don't agree with it, not me and you, but a person, it's, it's a sinkhole. You're, you're going to sink right down in it. Are you going to be saved and go to heaven? Well, if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it doesn't really matter what you believe, apart from that. You can believe that Peter was your uncle. I, I mean, you're still going to go to heaven. For by grace you say through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God, lest any man, uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. But I don't just want to be saved, eternally connected to God through his son Jesus Christ, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the imputed righteousness given to me. I want to study to show myself a proof to God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Why? Because this is God's letter, a love letter to me, and if I love him, I will want to read what he has to say. Mm-hmm. To deny reading someone who is writing to me to express his thoughts, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, to do that, if I said to my wife, I love you, but I don't want to talk to you, it wouldn't take long where she would say, I hear what you say, but I watch what you do. And I don't really think you're genuine in your love. So God doesn't want, I mean, there are a lot of people that are saved, but they never go beyond saved. Or they go wacky in their Bible beliefs. That doesn't mean that they are unsaved. Many of them are saved. It just means they're wacky in their belief. Well, I don't want to be wacky in my belief. I want to know what did, what God wants me to know. And so, how do we get there? Well, we're talking about these absolutes. And when we, next week, if you can keep from one Wednesday to the next enough in your head, and compare what we did tonight with what we do next week, it's just like, whoa. Someone pulls the scales off your eye, and you see it so clear. That there are two Gospels, two kingdoms. And they are represented, I say it so many times, you're going to get sick of me saying it, by John 1.11 and John 1.12. One is to the Jew, and the other one is to anybody else. And when you accept the anybody else Gospel, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, everyone becomes church of God. You lose that identity. It doesn't matter over here. Over here, the only way you get that gospel is to be a proselyte or be Jewish. But this one, in this kingdom, you lose your national identity and you become one with Jesus Christ. All right? Okay. Well, I've thrown my marker. (laughs) You're going to toss it from one hand to the other. That must be a lady I can't even catch. Uh, And we spent a little bit longer than I intended, but uh, it's hard to break this up so that you don't break right in the middle of something. But so try to keep in your mind. This is we just looked at this one all night tonight. Okay, next week we're going to look at this one. Stark in comparison. All right. If you want to do a homework study, like you don't have anything else to do, like just look the word gospel up. In a concordance. If you look the word gospel up in the concordance, you're going to find this amazing thing that the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is preached here and here, but not there. And the gospel of uh, the uh, grace of God, the gospel of Christ's Son, or God's Son, the gospel of Christ, my gospel, the gospel of peace, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, every one of those is right here. And when you look at the context, all of them are about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every one of them. They're all right in that parenthesis right there. Because it's it's not this. It's this. Remember what this is. Jesus said, oh, the gospel, uh, the gospel of the kingdom of God 
is not here or there. It's in you. When he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Don't look at it. You can't see it. Neither did you say, lo here or lo there, for the gospel of God is within you. One with Christ. Okay? So we'll look at that next week. And then we'll go to this one. And I think we're going to stop with this one. And that is the word baptism. And again, beyond the fact that we're learning so many other things along the way, the whole purpose for these ten is for us to go back to what's the difference between the universal church and the local church. And we'll resolve that quickly with this base. Having got this down, it'll be so simple. We'll just simply look at Mr. Graves' uh, assertions and go, eh, nope. <laughs> no, no, that's not true. It's not biblically correct. But that's how they do that. They make a statement that's not true, but has enough truth in it to be believable. And then they build a whole building on top of that. And they tell everybody to look at the top of the building, not the base. See, the base is faulty. And if the base is faulty, the rest of it doesn't matter. Okay? All right. I can keep going. We have some prayer requests that we want to consider tonight and uh, speak of. One of them is, uh, I don't know that you you all here, I know some people at home will know this name that are watching us now or later online, but uh, uh, Greg Hellman uh, is uh, very influential. Over the years, he and his wife, Carol, uh, in church here, um, and uh, a lot of the folks that still go here are related. Greg and Carol both have been very, very ill, um, gravely ill, and uh, several months ago, Greg went through and had one hip replaced, and today he went and got the other hip replaced. Hopefully, that will help him with mobility. And he will be able to come back, but he's hardly been able to walk. So uh, remember him. He's number two on the list. Uh, had a hip replacement today, class uh, university. Okay. Uh, number one uh, on the list, uh, my mom. She has a compressed disc fracture. Uh, she cannot get an MRI because she has a pacemaker. No surgeon would do back surgery without an MRI, and especially if the person is 89 years old. So they decided that the only option that she really has is to see if they can give enough uh, instructions through physical therapy and a back brace to give her enough time without re-injuring herself for that to heal to the point where she can operate fairly independently. So that's the ultimate goal, is to give her some space of time for that to heal. We all know that as you age, it's harder and harder and takes longer and longer for us to heal. So uh, they have a facility uh, that is an acute rehab center. Acute just means that if you go to, like, Dorothy Love or one of those, they give you physical therapy one time a day. Maybe it lasts 30 minutes, and then you wait 23 and a half hours to your next one. You don't do anything in those 23 and a half hours except for sit there and then wait for your next 30 minutes. At an acute rehab center, they give you three or four therapy treatments per day. They give you enough time in between them to uh, sleep and rest. They try to manage your medications so that you receive your pain medication and then you go to physical therapy. And then it wanes. They give it to you again, then you go to your next one. So that's kind of the way they're doing it. And uh, so um, today I heard from her. Uh, she was like a different woman today. I mean, after just really just the, the morning. And so uh, praise the Lord for that. She's doing much better. Uh, there's a lot more individual care. Uh, you press a button here at this facility, someone's in your room immediately. Uh, you know, we had 
had some bad experiences at the other places where you press the button and uh, if it was an emergency, you would have soiled yourself. I mean, it's just impossible. They just, it's not their fault, uh, the nurses, they have too many people that they have to care for. And so, uh, but at any rate, uh, she's in a real good shape and she's pleased. Uh, this could be uh, a couple month thing, could be longer, could be this and then something else after. Uh, we don't know at this point. Uh, then also, number three, Mary Lane's uh, grandson, still at the hospital, but doing better. Uh, Jeff's at home. Uh, one of the great things about this is that they, not only did he have this issue uh, with the aneurysm, but this landlord also said that he had to leave. Uh, the landlord found out his health situation, said, don't worry about that, we'll take care of that later. Stay there, get well, and then we'll talk about that. So that's one of the things that's off of their mind as far as worry. Uh, they have put him on a heart monitor. He's having a little trouble with uh, being light-headed and busy. Uh, Frank asked for prayer for his sister, Carolyn. So a schedule for open heart surgery sometime this month. And then Larry has fallen now at the pavilion. Uh, uh, his wife, I believe, Becky, uh, brother, is also there. Uh, are, and both Larry and her, her brother are in wheelchairs, so please pray for them and for Becky as well. I don't know that any of you have been here, but uh, Larry used to come in a, in a wheelchair and sit back in the very back in between the two doors to the Andrew Fellowship room back there. Um, hasn't been here for quite a while before COVID, but uh, that's who that is. And then Landon uh, received uh, the results of his MRI and CT scan. Uh, they're continuing treatments for his cancer. Linda, that's Ellen's sister. Ellen is our moderator and she works in the office. She's the treasurer. Uh, she has, uh, Ellen has Parkinson's and she just found out her sister, uh, Linda, also has Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. So um, just diagnosed with it. Uh, number nine, you have Jan's daughter, Laura, more complications with her leg. Please keep them in prayer. And then Jeff's sister, uh, had to go back to wearing a boot again due to complications. Uh, Rob uh, really is doing much better um, with physical therapy and uh, praying that uh, the small tear in his knee will heal. So I uh, pray, pray for that. Uh, for Matt and uh, um, uh, Thomas's family, uh, also their the daughters uh, or wives, dad, Steve, um, please be in prayer for their family. Uh, they have now come to the end, uh, very near the end of Vonda's existence here, and uh, it's a tough, 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 tough thing. It's been going on for a year, and now they're right at the threshold, and uh, she could pass it any day. Please remember them in prayer as she's receiving hospice care. And then uh, Judy and Ed, Ed like the ever ready bunnies, man, they just keep on going. Uh, but pray for them. Uh, Judy has uh, cancer; is she's on hospice. And then, and, um, and then Jim and uh, Joan, daughter, um, they have uh, two children adopted, uh, and now after nine and twelve years, the birthing father wants to have involvement in their life. And uh, so please pray for them. That's tough when you raise children as your own children through the adoption process. And then at any stage in their life, his life, the adopt, uh, the biological can come back in, wreck havoc, and then leave again. So uh, please keep them in your prayer. Um, and to be honest, I don't know if he is doing that. Yeah, I just know that that often is the story of what happens. Could be that he's not. Uh, just remember that family in prayer. And then um, we mentioned last week Tracy Wells been declared cancer free. Brenda's sister in law, Debbie, is uh, planning for kidney transplant, has a donor, and it will happen on December 9th. And uh, then we had Steve on our phone, uh, prayer list for quite a long time about cancer. 
and is in remission and has been for some time. He had been declared cancer-free as well. That's a praise. Okay? All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father, we pause uh, after mentioning all these names while I'm mentioning to those that are listening online and those that are here. At the same time, we make our prayer to you with those words that we just said. Um, Lord, we thank you for the people that you've given to us to remember in our prayers. Uh, and certainly we do ask that you would be with them. And I know that you have been in, in a marvelous way with my mom. And I pray that you continue to be with her each day. May she get stronger. Give her a fighting spirit. Uh, and help her, Lord, not to give in. And I pray, Father, that you give her wonderful attendants who would help her and encourage her so that she can get well. I pray, Father, also that you be with Greg. Uh, right after the surgery, Lord, it's not a fun time. Uh, a lot of medication, a lot of pain. I just pray, Father, that the surgery was successful and also pray, Father, that his recovery would be quick. Lord, I uh, you know our hearts on that. And then, Father, for Jeff, and pray for him and for Cheryl. Our heart goes out to them. For Larry and his wife and brother, uh, wife's brother. Uh, Lord, I pray for Ellen and uh, her sister. Uh, that's got to be tough. And I pray, Father, for uh, Judy and Ed. It goes out to them. For these others that are on our list the praise that are due you, Lord, uh, what a joy it was to sit down with the, my uh, boys the other night and just say, uh, look what we have to be so thankful for. Tracy's name, we prayed for her every night since the first day that we were told that she had cancer. And our family prayed, our church family has prayed. And Lord, we are beside ourselves with joy. Uh, that, Lord, you heard our prayer, you answered our prayer, and now uh, she has been declared cancer-free. The same for Debbie. Uh, we have prayed each evening in our home, and I know that we have prayed here that you would raise up someone that could be a donor, that the donor uh, would be able to, uh, willing to give, that Debbie's body would be able to receive, and that, uh, Lord, it would uh, be a sufficient uh means for her to have a, a normal life. And Lord, you've answered that prayer. We are beside ourselves with thanksgiving and with joy. Uh, the same, Lord, for so many others, Stephen and others who have prayed for, and you have uh, uh, given us the desire of our heart. We know sometimes, Lord, we don't get the desire of our heart because uh, there is a greater, um, a greater thing to be done. But we thank you, Lord, for that. And to look back over, we think of Anna, we think of um, uh, ben, we prayed for him for so long, cancer-free now. Uh, Anna, cancer-free. Uh, there's so many of these, Lord, that you have blessed us with seeing your mighty hand at work. We pray that you continue to be with them. We're with our church family, many needs that are present. Pray, Father, that you be with the class on Sunday school. Uh, Lord, the enthusiasm would not wane, but there would be a, a, a desire to know and help us with that. And I pray, Father, that you bless your word. Uh, Lord, you know that we never, ever stand in judgment of it, but always stand in judgment of us. And, Lord, we surrender our will to yours. And I pray, Father, that you honor that and that you use it for a purpose beyond what we can imagine or think. Bless, I pray, this evening, all of the things that are going on inside the church. We give you praise. Pray in Jesus' precious name, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Pray that you have a good second half of the week. Boy, this is going to be exciting. Amen. Temperatures are heading down. Uh, coats are coming out. Uh, and the next thing we'll know is this little white stuff, and it won't be dandruff. Amen. Uh, but uh, have a great second half of the week. Lord willing, see you Sunday at 9.15. Have a Bible, notebook, pen, and ready to go. God bless. Thanks so much. You didn't have to mention the snow. <laughs>